So good afternoon, everybody. This is what is called the Center's Report. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of history. As you know, Harry Lucas and the EAF have been supporting the Legacy Conference for almost 20 years now. About 10 years ago, it was decided to establish some centers in order to perfect the development and the dissemination of IBL. These centers now have been in existence almost 10 years, and what we've been doing at each of the legacy meetings is to let them give a report on their activities with an emphasis on how their activities impact the larger community. Um, the, 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 four, the four universities are the University of Chicago, University of Michigan, UC Santa Barbara, and the University of Texas. We'll start with John Bowler at the University of Chicago. So hi, my name is John Bowler. Uh, I'm representing the University of Chicago's activity as an IBL center. As Ron said, we've been a center since 2004, um, and one of the driving forces of Chicago's participation as a center uh, came, and uh, it's, uh, sorry to set, start on a sad note, uh, but of course I have to share this news at this particular meeting, uh, was the passing of Paul Sally, uh, who was a legendary professor in the math department, who was the probably Chicago in the, this latest uh, iteration of IBL, uh, the, the great moving force behind things. But I'm also here to reassure everybody publicly that uh, things are going along quite well uh, despite Paul's passing. We're doing the best we can without him, uh, but, but the IBL activities have been firmly embedded in Chicago's undergraduate program, especially in a lot of the outreach programs as well. And uh, I'm here to tell you about some of those details. Uh, so, so 2004, uh, when, when Chicago was approached, and I think Chicago was on the list of places to be approached, of course, because uh, R.L. Moore got his degree there. So uh, we have a proud tradition going way back uh, involving uh, R.L. Moore. It's more, more appropriate than ever to, to, to mention his name at this conference. Uh, but in the 21st century, anyway, uh, Paul Sally thought that this would be a fantastic idea. In fact, he kind of thought that he'd been doing IBL his whole life anyway, uh, always having students at the board and doing small group work and those kinds of things. But in particular, when presented with this opportunity from uh, Harry Lucas and the EAF, uh, he, he, he jumped on it and said, well, you know, we can, we can do more. And we can do it truer to the spirit, I think, of what uh, Moore had in mind. So he teamed up with Diane Herman, who is a senior lecturer in the department and a co-director of the undergraduate program. Uh, that's also my title at this point. I worked uh, with Paul very closely. He was my advisor, but I've worked very closely with Diane Herman as well. He teamed up with Diane to take a script that, Di so Diane had had some experience with uh, an, an IBL course back in, when she, in Allegheny College herself, and so they, they took a script that treated single variable real analysis uh, from, a, from a script student presentation point of view. So uh, I'd ac ask my, my tech friends in the back there to call up one of the, uh, one of the files. If you could call up M161 script 2 PDF, there it is. So uh, now I can talk a little bit about why it's script two, but <laughs> uh, but they took an, a, a, this, just this rigorous axiomatic approach, but they decided to approach the real numbers from the point of view of the continuum first, the topological point of view. And from there, build up all of the uh, properties about least upper bounds and, and so on, and then to do the calculus from there. And so they developed this whole year-long course, and it was completely experimental, and they had a group of 15 or so students, and it was just this raging success, so that the next year, two such sections were offered, and then more and more and more. Right now, we have four sections of this course that are year-long in scope that start with the axioms for the continuum, eventually play in the algebraic structure of the real numbers, and eventually get to all the wonderful theorems of calculus, fundamental theorem, sequences and series and so on. Uh, this is the bread and butter, I think, of the IBL program at Chicago, but there's a lot more to it, uh, which uh, I will get to here in a minute. But I think I should say the role that this plays, this isn't just sort of a little specialty course at Chicago. It really is the fundamental starting place at Chicago. Chicago is, of course, a world-class uh, research institution. The college of the University of Chicago includes only about 5,000 students, and that's after recent growth. So it's actually a medium-sized college at, at most. And 
somehow out of a class of, or sorry, out of a, uh, a student body of 5,000 and a graduating class of under 1,300, we have now over 100 math majors per year. It's actually closer to 130. It's something like, it's over 10% of the graduating class is math majors. And we attribute this in no small part to the honors calculus program overall, and, and in particular, the IBL part of that. Uh, the, the IBL courses, the 160s courses, these honors calculus courses just have gotten this fantastic reputation on campus for being the cool thing to do. And of course, okay, yeah, U of C, it's a nerdy place, right? But <laughs> come on, even so. Uh, so over the years, let's see if I can maybe uh, ask my, my, my tech friends in the back there to uh, switch over the slide. I have a slide that's uh, IBL, uh, IBL data that ends in the word calculus. So like I said, it was one section in 2004, and then two, and then three, and now four, and we're continuing to offer four. Uh, so hundreds and hundreds of students, of course, have come through this uh, program. and. Many, many, many of them have gone on to become math majors. This is sort of our invitational course. We take students who may not have entered the college entering, uh, intending to do mathematics at all, but uh, this is the course that we win them over in their first quarter. We teach them, hey, look, college mathematics is different, and getting this particular kind of ownership over the material cannot be beaten. So on the right-hand column, you get a sense of the enrollments in these courses as we go through the years. If we could just sort of scroll down maybe a little and on maybe even onto page two, it's not, uh, I can share as much data with you as you like. It's just a bunch of numbers right now. But, but it's, sort of, it's on the order of 100 students a year now <coughs> uh, who, who come through the, that course. In addition to this, of course, this may, we, now our model for teaching these courses is that we have two experts in the room. Uh, and this is partly because we have, we're operating at a very high level, and it's very difficult for one person to pay attention to all those great questions and comments that are being said by the students. Uh, of course, one student is at the board giving their presentation, but so many people are asking questions and, and having that little almost under their breaths kind of comment, and you have to be able to draw that out. Um, so we, we like to have two instructors in the room, and we also, as a uh, fairly well-to-do private institution can afford to have a graduate student assistant in there as well. What this means, though, is that we are also in the business of training an awful lot of people in at, to become IBL practitioners. So uh, each year now, we have four sections of the Honors Calculus, plus there's a few other courses. There's another slide I can show you in a minute on some of the other courses that we also offer in an IBL format, the Math 175, Number Theory, 176, Basic Geometry, uh, the, a few isolated outli outliers. But every year, essentially, we're having five such courses with two instructors and therefore, and, and a number of and graduate students along the way there. So, so each year, we're getting at least two new postdocs who are new to the IBL experience, who then can go off to their permanent positions and be experienced practitioners and to have had that training. Now, we're not just being, they're not just being shown how to do it, they're doing it alongside an expert. Uh, we're getting five graduate students a year, or in some cases a few more, uh, depending on exactly how the numbers play out, uh, who come out with this training as well and then go on to their postdocs and are ready to do an IBL course. Uh, just to speak personally for a moment, uh, Mona Merling, a uh, graduate student, uh, at Chicago who's just finishing up right now, she co-taught the geometry course, the Math 176, with me this past winter, and she got a position at Hopkins where uh, they've asked her to do exactly that, to teach a, an IBL geometry course. So she's just grabbed the materials that we started with and is gonna expand it uh, and do a full-on course uh, in uh, hyperbolic geometry. So uh, very exciting of the kind of, the kind of uh, later influence. Uh, a number of the centers here we, we share, uh, we've shared over the years a number of, uh, of folks. Uh, we've sent uh, Ronnie Hadani down to Texas, and we sent graduate students off to Michigan, and so on and so on. Uh, Corinne, <laughs> sitting in the back of the room, <laughs> went off to Texas and uh, had great success. So, uh, I don't want to take too much time here. I want to give my, my colleagues here a chance to say their piece as well. Let me, let me turn uh, my attention just a little bit to some of the outreach programs that we do, because we certainly think of the undergraduate program as the basics, right? That's, that's what we do very well. But uh, we also use IBL in a number of outreach programs. Uh, Paul Sally gets credit for many of these. Uh, one of his programs was the Young Scholars Program. Now this is, the potential for impact here is enormous because the Young Scholars Program is a way of bringing very talented Chicago public school students who don't necessarily normally have these kinds of opportunities to campus for Saturdays during the academic year and for a four-week program during the summers. And they are grouped in seventh and eighth grade component, ninth and tenth grade component, eleventh and twelfth grade component. We bring about a hundred of these students every summer. 
and they get to dig in on math mathematics beyond their high school or middle school, high school curriculum. Arnie Lulavishis uh, has been teaching an IBL course for the 11th, 12th grade component for a number of years now. Paul Sally himself taught an IBL uh, course for the 9th, 10th grade component for a number of years. I will do my best to pick up the slack uh, and take the reins from that course for him this summer. Uh, but so these students then now are, are getting opportunities, like I said, that uh, you know, the Chicago public schools are certainly not the model uh, of the uh, public school system that you would want to, uh, you know, so let's just say there's a lot of challenges. Uh, but some of the students don't get the kinds of opportunities that they would in some other districts. And so uh, th this is a fantastic way. Paul always saw it as a, a great uh, part of a, almost a social justice mission, I think, to, to make these kinds of things ac available uh, to these kinds of students. Uh, again, without taking too, too much time, the, we have a UTEP program where we train uh, pre-service teachers using IBL methods. We have a SESAME program where we train in-service uh, teachers using modified IBL methods. And uh, a number of other programs, the Woodlawn Project, uh, concerning the neighborhood just to the south of the university uh, that I'll be engaged in an IBL style course with them this summer as well. So. I don't know how much more I should be saying here. I, I, I might just add, you know, the growth is fantastic. Like I said, we keep adding courses based on student demand. <laughs> I mean, what could there, could there be greater testimony for the success here that more that students themselves want to do this, not just because we think it's a great idea, which we do, but, but the students know themselves and they, they keep asking for more. So uh, we've, I, I think we've, we've done some great work because of the fantastic support that we've received over the years and we continue Continue apace. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Harry. <clears throat> I realized I should have introduced myself before I started. I'm Ron Douglas. I'm at Texas A&M University, and it's been my pleasure to coordinate this activity over the last almost 10 years. Uh, after everybody's had a chance to say something, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Our next. Uh, speaker is Ralph Sponsier from the University of Michigan. Well, hello. It's been uh, 10 years, and I would say it's been an interesting, exciting 10 years. I remember starting IBL program at Michigan, not really knowing what to do. We had Mort Brown who knew IBL, that was more or less it. Maybe now we have a couple more people who know about IBL. Uh, well, we definitely do. Well, actually, so we've been doing this for 10 years, but in some sense we've been doing it for 20 years because uh, we have this program called Michigan Calculus, which is not full-scale IBL, but it is half IBL. So students come to class in our calculus program. Classes are reasonably small, about 30 students, and they have to do group work in class. So they have to actively um, work with the material that they just learned or heard about, and so it is quite IBL in many ways. And we've been doing this for 20 years, and again, that was Mort's um, huge contribution as well as some other people. Anyhow, so at this point of time, um, I can say that we have about three to 400 students per year who are taking IBL courses. We have 3,500 who take Calc 1 and Calc 2, and as I said, that's um, largely IBL. Um, so from, eh, maybe we had Mort's course, and maybe had one other course which wasn't really IBL, so we went from one to two IBL courses to now 13. Um, if some other ones come away, hopefully. Um, of those 13, they're all distributed all over. We have freshman courses. We have two different freshman courses, more, three sections of it. We have um, courses for math majors, five going, uh, going up in the near future, hopefully. We have six different math ed courses. Um, so we, to just say something about the freshman courses, they are courses which are sort of 
alternatives to starting up with calculus. So to give students the, an insight into what it means to do mathematics outside calculus. So we have an introduction to cryptology course, which is mostly number theory, but with uh, standard applications to, number, to uh, cryptology. And students are doing those by working on problems themselves, by exploring um, problems on the computer, etc. Ben Dinovitz has been teaching it for the last two years. He's here at the conference, not here in the room, but anyhow, he's the person to talk about the details. Um, we have the follow-up course in uh, basic calculus, ideas of calculus. We call it explorations in analysis and topology. Um, it's sort of a pre-real analysis course. We have a real analysis course, which is the one which Mort Brown had developed um, uh, 10, 12 years ago. And we've modified it, etc. But it's largely his course. Uh, you have topology course. We have a course which um, introduces students to research. We call it explorations in uh, math research course, which is very radical and quite different from anything else. So students basically have to work on open-ended problems for uh, a semester. Two to, sorry, about three problems a semester. We work on them in groups. They're open-ended, so nobody ever knows what happens at the end. Sometimes these problems become research problems, either pursued by students or you know faculty or um, other instructors, and um, so it's exciting. Uh, we have. Maybe the most exciting transformation though has been in our math education program where we went from a very standard, not particularly sophisticated and not very difficult um, way of learning about math education for future teachers, principally of um, elementary and middle schools, but also of high school teachers. So we went from zero courses to now six, which is all of our math ed courses. They are supplemented by courses the students have to take in the School of Education. And from what I understand, uh, so those courses are also have a fairly good IBL-ish flavor. So um, anyhow, I think that transformation is huge because I think it's a very meaningful um, way for future teachers to learn about mathematics and what the mathematics they really have to deal with in the classroom later, um, how to understand it, how to understand it from their students' perspectives, um, et cetera. So um, that was a hard transformation because you know there was a lot of struggle. There was a lot of students who didn't really want to learn this way to the situation we have now where I think students coming in just now, oh, these math ed courses, they are IBL, and this is the way we are doing it. And oh, yes, we as future teachers will actually have to go present mathematics in our classroom, so maybe we should actually learn about it by presenting it in the courses ourselves. So I think it's a very motivating factor for these students, and uh, I, th I think it's great success. Um, what else to say? Well, in addition to these courses, we also have several courses which use um, IBL modules. So that's something I think that we've been doing more than some of the other centers. So it's an IBL module. Um, so you take a class about some standard topic and you take part of a week, maybe one hour a week or one, two hours a week, and you discuss something in an IBL fashion. That something could be additional material which is closely associated with a course. So I've been doing it, for example, in a course about um, vector calculus, hardcore vector calculus, I mean proof-based vector calculus, where the students learn about measure theory and integration on their own using worksheets and group work, et cetera, um, and other courses. Um, so we are currently planning to uh, put some IBL into our standard linear algebra course, which is really our first proof-based course in our standard math major program. Uh, so the way you're planning to do it is again more as a module, um, because linear algebra is very difficult to um, ad adapt, and some of well, there are many reasons. But so anyhow, we are planning to um, take 
probably about half a half the hours every week and make them into an IBL experience to start off just with two sections. Hopefully we'll be able to expand later and make this whole thing into a model which can be expanded and that will work with class sizes of about 30, which is non-trivial. Um, so uh, in a similar vein, we have uh, our Calc 1 and Calc 2 classes are all small, about 30. Um, our Calc 3 and 4, so um, vector calculus and um, differential equations classes are quite large. So at this point of time, we are planning to uh, change our Calc 3 a bit by adapting um, the standard model of you know, three lectures um, plus one recitation into one which has less lectures, about only half lectures, and um, two recitation classes, or we will we'll call them a lab, where the students are going to actually interface with, a prob with problems at hand directly in groups, working on them, etc. So hopefully this will work out. This is actually a part of a, a more major transformation uh, in uh, the STEM programs at Michigan. Um, the STEM people, physics, chemistry, some engineering, math, have gotten a major NSF grant, and um, so we, math will get a small amount of that, and we will use it for this rebuilding of the calc-free courses. So what else? Uh, so I already talked a little bit about math ad. There are some additional things in my math ad. We'll have a math circle for teachers. Uh, we are planning to run a regional workshop for other math ad instructors from the area. Um, the whole transformation of the math ad program, I think, at this point of time, is mostly led by Alejandro Uribe, who's been involved for quite some time, and Nina White, who's come on board um, recently. She's here at the conference, and um, she's great to talk to. There's another major aspect of um, IBL in Michigan, that is we have one of the largest, if not the largest, um, postdoctoral program in the country, and as such it's a fantastic training ground for young people doing IBL. So they actually are training lots of postdocs. Um, we have seven currently involved in teaching IBL courses. Three of them uh, have moved on just this last year to tenure track positions um, elsewhere. So hopefully we will uh, pick up on IBL at some point of time in the future and um, teach classes wherever they are. We are uh, this year trained two graduate students. We have about we have undergraduate assistants in our courses, which means about ten people get trained in uh, teaching in the IBL way very directly. A lot of them come to our classes, participate in actually running the class. So this is a fantastic experience. Uh, what else? Um, well, one, one wonderful thing we have uh, sort of on a monthly basis is we have IBL lunches. This is a great way of getting IBL instructors and other people interested in IBL uh, together, discuss what's going on, discuss problems, discuss uh, good things that are happening, or just yeah, talk about IBL. Uh, it's been very successful, and um, different people have gotten to know each other this way. So this is uh, an activity I strongly support. Uh, we also have I think we are really unusual in that one. Together with the School of, Orientation, uh, of Education, the math department runs a math education seminar. So, which is, meets a couple times a semester, not on a weekly basis, but maybe once a month or so. And we have a speaker who talks about math education issues, which are often related to IBL. So um, that's, a, again, I mean, if you can get together with your um, school of education and have such an event, I think it's a fantastic way to interact with uh, people from the other side and build really positive relationships. Um, IBL workshops, I think other people have discussed them, but I think our IBL centers have um, had five, well, they've had four, and there's going to be another workshop this summer, two. Um, I think that's a fantastic development and a great way to learn about IBL. Um, so let me just say, well, there's been a little bit of outreach. I think just by having personal associations with people at other universities, we had some other people in places with 
Previously, didn't have any IBL start, some IBL, and I think that's fun to, uh, again a wonderful development. Um, grad program. Sometimes the question comes up about IBL in graduate classes, and I've actually been experimenting with it, and that's the last thing I'm going to say. Um, so. I decided last semester, I was teaching a graduate class, to just see if we could just have a class office hour where the students could come and we could discuss the homework problems and do presentations for it. And I couldn't require it because of the particulars of the class, but the people who did come, I think had a very positive experience and will uh, do this again next semester in a graduate class I'm teaching. And if anybody wants to discuss that some more, I'll be happy to do that. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Ralph. Our next speakers are from the University of California, Santa Barbara, Monica and Elizabeth. Okay, so I'm Elizabeth Thorne. This is Monica Mendoza, and we're at the University of Santa Barbara, or so University of California in Santa Barbara, and uh, we're just gonna sort of highlight some of the, the, the activities that we're doing, and we put together a picture slideshow because pictures are fun. Um, and so the big points are we do a lot of K through 12 outreach, and that's Monica's domain, so she's gonna tell you guys about it, um, and also community outreach, um, and we'll talk about our, our efforts for graduate student training and uh, efforts to develop new course materials and then a, a little bit of scholarships that's coming out of all of this work. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to Monica to talk about. Hi, thank you. Um, so this picture here is of our uh, teachers in Santa Barbara at our, one of our workshops. And so we're pleased that our partnership with Santa Barbara Unified School District has nearly doubled. We're currently supporting eight schools, 97 teachers, and over 2,000 students in grades K through six. Um, most of our students are on free and reduced lunch. We offer professional development at the school site during the academic year in the form of a lesson study. And so this picture here is of two fourth grade teachers on the right, um, a fifth grade teacher and the UCSB STEM director. And so we spend two intense days together followed by a three week of uh, co-teaching. The first day teachers grapple with the math that their students will embark on and examine uh, case studies of children in inquiry-based classes. The second day consists of uh, teachers opening up their classroom, launching a mathematical investigation with their students while their colleagues and I reflect and, and observe them in the back. And so then after the, uh, the day is over, we reflect and debrief. We then repeat this into another classroom with the new uh, participating teacher reflect and debrief, and then at the end of the day, we follow with a um, long-term planning. And uh, the three weeks, there's three weeks after this is over where we support them in, in implementing these inquiry-based um, courses, inquiry, sorry, inquiry-based uh, learning in the classroom. And so the fifth grade students, this is a, a slide of a, of a fifth grade student solution, and so, the point here, this the point here with this slide is that the, the transition um, that we expect of students is not easy and not um, always accomplished, and so um, our work currently is with teachers emphasizing on the awareness and transition of these instructional shifts. With now with the implementation of the Common Core standards and the Smarter Balance test. Uh, we are in great demand, and so that's why I, we've doubled in our work and our partnership with the district. We are currently co-running a STEM-focused summer school at our campus that came out of our collaboration with one of our partner elementary schools, Harding University Partnership School. The summer school is for ages uh, 9 to 11, incoming grades 4 through 6. Each grade level meets for 55 minutes per discipline in math, science, and technology and it's a Monday through Friday, three week course. So these students here, this is the picture of them currently, and so this is happening right now. That was Monday, right? Yeah, that was Monday, and so it runs from June, what is it, June 16th to July 3rd. And so now I'm gonna hand it off to Elizabeth. Okay, uh, 
Yeah, so I, wanted, I also wanted to talk about uh, some of the graduate student training that we do. Um, so we've got uh, three, uh, three course sequence of honors courses um, that are always run IBL, and this is our really nice classroom. I should probably thank the EAF for, um, and UCSB, but we've got whiteboards all around the room, um, and it's a really nice setup. And the person you see there is Grace. She was my TA uh, last fall. And so what we have is we have TAs in the classroom for all of these courses. And then also we have um, courses for pre-service teachers uh, that also have graduate students involved with the running of those courses, and they're in the classroom every day. So these graduate students are really involved with uh, learning how to interact with students in a classroom like this and then reflecting on that with you know whoever the instructor is afterwards. Um, so that's really nice for our strictly IBL courses but I teach really big lectures as well because we're a big state school and I wanted to bring IBL into those lectures and so the only way I could see to do it or the best avenue would be in discussion sections with TAs and so um, we've been trying to come up with good plan for training TAs for those discussion sections. And I had a pretty good run this year. I worked with eight different TAs. Uh, we did something like Ted Mehavior's uh, Homework Fridays in discussion section. So uh, I tried to help support my TAs in doing that. Uh, you know, varying degrees of success. And then I also worked on writing materials for section that TAs could turn around and use without too much training, because they're really new at teaching. Um, and so I've had a lot of fun with that, and we're thinking about how to expand that, how to, to get IBL into sections more actively. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is oh, I wrote a new approach to developing materials. It's new to us. It's not new. <laughs> um, and so I'm starting with a problem. Uh, suppose you need to find the volume of a bunch of potatoes, and you want to program a robot to do your work for you. <laughs> Write down specific instructions you would give your robot. Uh, so this is how I'm introducing integration, or at least area integrals, in vector calculus. You're finding the volume of a shape. Um, and I wanted to share this problem with you guys to, to show you this approach that you know, we're sort of coming around to is put the math in the forefront. What I like about this problem is it's, there's no jargon, there's no notation hurdles, there's no weird definition to get through. This is literally a very down-to-earth problem, and then you ask students to come up with their ideas, you compare the ideas, and you end up with Riemann sums every time. And then the students use this language. Like the whole time we were talking about volume integrals, and the hardest part is setting up the, the, end, uh, setting up the integrals the right way, they were talking about French fries and potato chips. Like these are the slices, and now we're making them French fries. Um, and so we, just, we had that language, and it's because we started the whole unit with this really simple question and had this sort of really, everyone got their mind around it in a real way. Um, and also extending this, I was thinking, for linear algebra, I took all the theorems out of our notes. And I just left the problems that motivate those theorems. And then I gave the students room to conjecture. And they did really fantastic job of conjecturing just all the big theorems that come basic linear algebra stuff. Um, and it was hard for them. And we did it in a wiki so they could revise it. But I feel like this new approach where you sort of put the math ideas in the front and let them develop the notation and the definitions and all the things that are really kind of hurdles to getting started, uh, we're having a lot of success with it. And so this was a, um, a response from one of my students in vector calculus. Um, and it was an anonymous survey, so they didn't have to be nice. Um, <laughs> They said, I've learned the best way to learn a concept isn't to tackle an abstract problem with a formula. If you want to learn a concept, you should make yourself want to explore a common everyday problem, and we can imagine and relate it, and then scale that up into higher degrees or modify that into a mathematical concept. I mean, this is the most exciting feedback I've ever gotten from a student, because I feel like this student gets what math is about. They walked away, and now they're explaining to me how to do math, so I thought that was great. Um, oh yeah, did you? Is this me? Okay. Well, that's both. This is kind of what we talked about at lunch. So we're also doing some scholarship. Uh, and this is a picture of Bill. Bill Jacob couldn't be here today. Um, but he's in the classroom with uh, some of the pre-service teachers. So this is Math 100 AB, right? Mm -hmm. And so this, they're in the classroom there, and, and this 
that this picture on the left is of student is a video of, of uh, the case study that they viewed during the class and so what came of this is is uh, we presented at the American Educational Research Association and it, um, what we looked at was the development of early pedagogical content knowledge and prospective elementary teachers uh, just so that I get this correct um, and so what we found is the students who participated in the class um, said the following year as credential students took uh, this uh, state certified test called a PACT. And um, what we found were the former Math 100 AB students were able, well the Math 100 AB students, I'm sorry, is a course for elementary teachers. And the students were able to develop um, their ability to analyze models, big ideas, and children's work much differently than the students who did not enroll in the Math 100 AB course. Did you want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the reason, and so that was research, and the reason we want scholarship here is because um, I've actually done a little bit of like scholarship of teaching and learning. So Brian Katz and I co-authored a paper about using wikis in your course, um, and that just got published this morning. I think it's online and Primus's new special issue. So I'm gonna plug that. Um, is that, okay, so we're good on that one. Okay, so, so thank you guys for coming. Thank you to the EAF for all your support. And if you guys have any questions, we just updated the website. It looks really nice now. And, uh, and there's our contact information. Thank you very much. Our last speaker of the centers is Mike Starbird from the University of Texas. Well, I thought those were neat ideas, by the way. The, the, um, this idea of getting rid of the theorems. You know. Super fun. That really is cool, yeah. Yeah, to, to see if you can get people to really, you know, one of, the, one of my mantras is to not tell people the answer to questions they never considered asking. And, and I think that what you're saying is if you develop it right, they're asking that question. You're not just telling them that. So I, I think it, it's really a thought-provoking idea. So I'll take that to heart. So, um, <clears throat> Well, one of the things that I did this year was to write a, a history of IBL in the MAA over the last 100 years. They're doing a centennial volume you know, for, for the MAA. And so I thought I would tell you the whole history of IBL from, um, for the last hundred years. Is that okay? That's great. So in one, one place it starts is, and Albert Lewis was very helpful with me on this, by the way, I should say. So if I say anything wrong, it's his fault. Uh, so let's see, it, but it actually started with at Chicago, as you said, John, you know, E.H. You know, e. Moore was, was a guy at Chicago, and apparently back in the last, not the last century, but the century before last, the 1800s, there was a, a lot of interest in the laboratory method for uh, teaching science and doing science. And that concept of using laboratory philosophy, E.H. Uh, e. Moore, this professor at the University of Chicago, adopted that for his own classes. And so what he would do in his math classes, uh, I think the advanced um, you know, uh, graduate student classes, is that he would have his students come in and then he would just work on a research problem with them uh, together. And so it was a very, you know, interactive, working together on research kind of an experience. So it was interesting to me to realize that, as is the case with history, there really are no jumps in history. It's all incremental, if, if I understand history correctly. And in this case, it's R.L. Moore, who was a student at Chicago, a student of E.H. Moore. Clearly, his own philosophy of having the students do the work what had its own history and experience from E.H. Moore. So it was interesting that, that you know, all these ideas are evolving and they come from one idea to another to another and, and incrementally hopefully get better. Uh, but, but anyway, I, I found it interesting to, uh, to write this history and to, and to learn about, about this history. And, um, but now I'll skip a few, cent a few decades because we don't want to spend too much time in the 1800s. Uh, but we'll, we'll come to, the, uh, to 1996 is the next date that we'll come to, which is the date at which Harry Lucas uh, came to um, 
came to the Department of Math at, at, at Texas, and, and he said, well, he'd be interested in supporting a conference about the Moore Method, you know. And, and I remember very well on a Saturday morning, I and Jim Vick, a colleague of mine, met with Mr. Lucas down at the at Four Seasons Hotel, and we talked about this thing. And we, we created this conference in 1996, which included Mort Brown, for example, was, was at the conference. And, and I can't remember if there's a Michigan uh, Moore Brown was a Michigan person, but I, I was wondering if there was a Chicago person. I don't think so. But in any case, Moore Brown was there from Michigan, so that was another connection to one of the center uh, center schools at the very early date. And we had this this conference, and at, right off the bat, we were thinking about broadening it to broader groups of people, not only just mathematics, but beyond, and and broader audience, not just University of Texas, but nationally. And that theme has has persevered for the for the rest of the the time and I think that the all of these developments the centers and the and the books and the, the materials and the workshops really are you know flowed from the incremental development of, of uh, that started in um, for at least my connection with it started in in 1996 actually my connection started before that because I taught IBL classes in topology for my whole career uh, because I, I had a topology class at the University of Wisconsin uh, from, from a, a student of R.H. Bing, was my professor. And, and that's, that's what really made me excited about mathematics. I loved it, to do math. You know, listening to other people tell me how to do something, that never appealed to me very much and still doesn't. But the idea of actually working things out on my own, that was just great fun. You know, it was like a, a candy jar of wonderful treats that they were giving me to work on every day. And so that was a, that was a treat. So I, I taught topology that way my whole career, but that was basically it. In the math department, I was basically the only one using this kind of method in, in 1996. From 1996 to now, it really has been a revolution. And it's just absolutely amazing to me to see the difference between the practice of teaching in the department now versus uh, 1996. What, what happened is that we started um, this, this project with, uh, we, we actually started with a discovery learning project in the college. It was a college-wide project. And a lot of this discovery kind of an inquiry teaching is not just in the math department, but spread throughout the college. And, and we still have these monthly lunches for the whole college where, where faculty members come and, 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 uh, and, and listen and think about, about uh, teaching. And it has had a big effect college-wide and even beyond the college. <clears throat> but in the math department, what, one of the things that we started with was how to teach people to prove theorems you know, sort of introduction to proof classes. And this was a problem that was a recognized problem by the, by the department. And how could we approach that? There was a committee formed, and my former colleague, Ted O'Dell, uh, <clears throat> chaired it, <clears throat> because he's a very sensible guy. And one, the conclusion of that committee was that we created an IBL number theory course. And I taught the first one of those things. And that course has led to really dozens of postdocs, hundreds and hundreds of students, maybe a thousand students, um, and then students not, not only at Texas but around the country have, have, have now used materials from that course. But, but one of the things that it, it, it did, and graduate students who were, who were the TAs for that course over all these years have become like Elizabeth <laughs> was one of them, uh, was, uh, have gone on in their own careers to leave the school. And I would say that this is one of the things that we really should advertise as the centers in general. That and 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 both, uh, you know, uh, all all of the centers have talked about this, the effect of the postdocs and the graduate students at these research, you know, research one universities who go on and then spend their entire careers with this background of IBL instruction, and and we see it. We see it in the room here with people who are graduate students and postdocs uh, who, who have gone on to, to take leadership roles, not only just do it in their own classrooms, but take leadership roles in promoting IBL nationally. So, so I think that's one of, the, one of the real strengths that our centers do on a regular basis. And it's sort of, in a way, you can say, well, it's the mundane part, it's the daily, you know, it's what we do every year. It, you know, but in a way, I think it's it's also new every year because we have new people every year, and they 
learn a new, a new world to them and open it up and, and go on uh, to use it. So in, in the math department, what we, what we now do is teach many courses using IBL methods. The number theory course, topology course, analysis course, geometry course, discrete math course, courses for elementary teachers and high school teachers. There's a whole program, the UTeach program, which is our a high school teacher preparation program in the whole college has IBL methods as a centerpiece of that instructional uh, method. So, so it's beyond mathematics. Recently, we've done calculus and in a somewhat IBL, more IBL way. It, it's certainly not a pure IBL and the, the setting is very poorly designed for good instruction, frankly. It's taught in groups of 130 people and you know that's not really, perfect for, for this, uh, certainly Michigan by far, well, Michigan and Chicago by far have the best, I would say, introduction to calculus setups, small classes, intense, uh, really good experiences. Um, I, how many are in your, uh, uh, Elizabeth, in your introductory ca calculus classes? Uh, maybe 150, maybe 300. Yeah, 150 or 300. Ours are 130. And the thing is, you can do some things, and just as Elizabeth is, says that she was trying with giving TAs help and also in classes doing things where you have group work, that's what we're trying to do at UT. Maybe flipped classes is what they're called, where the students do some kind of passive stuff outside of class, but then in class they're given challenges to work on in little groups, and then the, the teacher and um, um, uh, graduate student assistants as well as undergraduate student assistants mill around and help the groups as, as they're working. So it's a more active experience during the class. And, and I, I have to say, I've visited lots of calculus classes which are straight lecture classes over the years by, you know, I, I go to evaluate faculty members and they really are terrible. Uh, first of all, half the students aren't even there. And the, the half that are there, half of them are asleep or more. You know, I just look at them, you know, they're just dozing. So th this method of having people actually working on things actively is a, is a huge step forward. Not perfect, but a, a, a big step forward. So that's, that's one of the things we're doing. We're getting a lot of support from the administration for this, and the success rates have improved, too, in our, in, uh, for the students who have this different, different approach. So that's, that's a success story. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, that the, um, at the whole university, inquiry has become built into the system at the university level. There's something called the uh, flag system, which we instituted a few years ago, which where undergraduates are required to get uh, certain kinds of experiences during their undergraduate career. And I think it's a fairly good system. The idea is that you don't require a particular class, but you require a certain feature of the class. So there's, a, for example, a writing class. Well, that could be in any subject, but it has intensive writing in it. Or another, another so that's a flag. And so every student has to have you know, a certain uh, writing flag. Another one is a quantitative literacy flag, qu quantitative reasoning flag. But one of them is the inquiry flag. So er every student, it, it's, it's being phased in. And so most students right now, undergraduate students, requ are required to take at least one course that has this inquiry flag. The good thing about this and the reason that we instituted it was that it causes the faculty to turn their minds toward giving that experience as part of what they offer to undergraduates. And, and, the, and it, it has that effect because they're required to do it, you know, the students are required to do it, that puts pressure on, this, on the faculty to create courses of that type. And in the mathematics department, for example, we had 13 courses that were designated as inquiry flag courses last year, and eight more have been uh, given this designation for, for next year. And it requires filling out a form and saying how it is, you, you, what, in what sense is inquiry there, and then how you're going to evaluate and all that kind of thing. So, so it's sort of built into the system, and I, I, I think that's a, a really nice um, uh, success. Um, so I told you about calculus. Um, Oh, yeah, the administration has done course transformation projects which have de dealt with biology, chemistry, and, and statistics, all of whom emphasized active learning and inquiry in, in the, the way that they completely changed their method of instruction in those courses as well. So I find it very, uh, very uh, interesting. Another national effect has to do with the materials that we're, we're producing, creating, and sending around. Uh, namely, 
uh, we had the number theory book that we wrote uh, that, that took our course in, in introduction to proof through number theory called Number Theory Through Inquiry. And that was published by the MAA. And then Brian Katz over there and I wrote a book called Distilling Ideas and Introduction to Mathematical Thinking, which was, came from an IBL course that we, we were uh, constructed for several years when he was a graduate student. And it is the, really the, uh, it, it created a sub-series of the MAA textbook series for inquiry. It's called in Mathematics Through Inquiry Subseries of the MAA. So what this is once again an invitation to other people to contribute to that, you know, series that has this national national uh, prominence. So we're delighted to to have the MAA give this this support, which it has done in many ways. One of which is these materials. But another way that we we uh, support these things is through workshops and presentations. Uh, the the workshops that we've given over the years there have been many through the centers. I mean, you all talked about the the centers workshops that we've had last four, but we also had previous workshops through the prep program, the MAA prep program had supported several IBL workshops preceding that particular grant. Remember, we had a previous grant that, that we, we did, uh, we used for, for workshops. And, um, and I think that this collaboration with the MAA has been very uh, significant and important. Uh, at UT, we're giving some workshops for targeted groups, such as the last summer we did one for the UT system schools, and we had representatives from every UT system school to come, come to our, our workshop. And I think that, that looking at groups of schools is something that, that our centers groups might think about doing. Paul Sally mentioned the idea of the athletic conferences, uh, you know, group which I thought was a silly proposal at first. Now, the more I think about it, the better I think it was as an idea. Um, this summer at UT, we're giving a, a, a workshop for community colleges. And, and that's because I, I had a, one of our IBL uh, uh, doctoral students in math education, she, she uh, participated in our classes, wrote her dissertation on IBL in community colleges. She taught at the local community colleges while she was a graduate student, Centriva Page. So she got her degree, her PhD in math education. I, I directed it, co-directed it with a math education professor. And so that's gotten us interested in the possibility of applying IBL methods in community colleges where where the, the problems are immense, as you know, that, uh, that mathematics is the stumbling block for so many students to succeed in college. So um, in any case, it really has been an amazing transformation over these last uh, 18 years, particularly, to, to see how IBL has been sort of built into the fabric of the national consciousness in educational practice. So uh, there's, there's lots of work to do. We're sort of in a different phase, I think, now, a phase of really um, trying to figure out how we can make the, the rate at which this is taken up more, more uh, quicker. But it does require every individual to be, to be treated and, and, and worked on, you know, to help people. It's not something that's immediate. You can inspire them to try, but it really re requires uh, effort, mentoring, and workshops and other kind of instruction, which we're, we're providing. So um, it's an exciting time, and it's, a, it's been a delightful ride. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Looking at the watch, I realize that we're more or less out of time. It's past 5.15. There is a reception. I, what I encourage you to do is to catch up with some of these people if you've got questions and, and ask them questions either today or tomorrow. Thank you very much.